Hey, Julia, great to connect with you. And it's fantastic to be able to catch up from both sides of the world because, of course, it's evening time in New Zealand. Here I am in Auckland, in New Zealand. And, of course, it's crack of dawn. Uh, and you're in London at the moment, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, I'm in London, bright and early. Yep. Right. This, is, this is a great way to start the day. I've got my coffee ready, so far away. Very good. I'm never quite sure where you're going to be at any given point in the world when I connect with you. So it's very exciting to, that you're home <laughs> in some familiar environments. But look, Julia, we were keen to get together because we both are very interested in the topic of leadership. And I was was really keen to sort of really tap into your perspective because you're working in fintech, you run your own business, you've been your own leader. And so I guess you're on the cutting edge of some of the technological changes that are happening in the world. And, and you're meeting a lot of leaders in that space. Similarly, I'm meeting a lot of leaders in, in a very different part of the world, you know, Aotearoa, New Zealand. And, and there are live conversations going on. And mm -hmm. I'd just love to mm -hmm. start by, by getting you to tell us a little bit about what you call enlightened leadership. I'm talking to people constantly in the world of technology, and whether that's financial services or any sector, there are some real messages coming through. And this is why I call it living in the age of enlightened leadership, because as leaders, I would say we've got to tackle things in a completely different way. I would argue that the rule book of leadership needs to be ripped up in so many ways, because what we've learned through our leadership coaching and our training and all the courses we've been on doesn't necessarily apply today when there are three major priorities on every CEO's mind. Number one is clearly steering your business through interesting economic times and geopolitical times. Times that, you know, right here in the UK, we have not had a war on a continent, you know, since the Second World War. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, you know, look at the geopolitical dynamics have changed. We've been through Brexit. We've been through years of COVID, indeed, as, as everybody has been. And now how do you come out the other side into an economic challenging time? So that's number one. How do, how do you do that? Some of those principles, the fundamentals of business still apply. How you do that is very different because at the same time, you've got the question of climate change. You've got the question about sustainability. And that brings into this whole play the conversation about purpose, which is not really something that organizations have talked about in the past. Yes, mission statements, vision statements, you know, all those values, that value work we've done in the past. But now it's about purpose because that's what the talent and the shareholders really want to talk about because we've got these climate change goals. The other piece of the equation is the pace and change. You know, so you know, look at the pace of AI, look at also low code and no code frameworks, look at the changes in engineering, look at the changes in APIs and platforms and integrations and, and, you know, and I could go on by the way. So digital transformations always been on our minds, but now yeah. this is completely different because it's about digital transformation at an incredible pace. And then the other big thing, of course, is talent. You know, the, the, the fight for talent, the talent war, the digital talent that we need, the jobs that are being taken over by AI, the, I mean, the new jobs that are going to be created. And by the way, your teams of people I won't necessarily all be sitting in your office every single day. So who's in, who's out, or who's here, who's not? So how we communicate yeah. our vision as leaders. So actually what it needs is some fresh thinking. And that's why I think enlightened leaders really get this. And, and that's where the diversity, equity, and inclusion piece comes in, right? We know that by having the di most diverse brains around any table, it's going to help us get the best ideas that will give us the competitive edge that will help us become really digitally enabled because actually in, in financial services, there are five generations working in financial services. So imagine <laughs> the pedigree of age and the experience of age working with digitally native people going, why are you doing it like that, right? We don't yeah, work like that. That's yeah. not how we think. That's not how we are. So this all requires leaders in organizations, top level, and also kind of ex so exec committee, as well as board levels, but right the way down. X code minus ones, minus twos to be thinking very differently. And think of yourself as an enlightened leaders. What are the behaviors of enlightened leaders? And so what, so what's, getting in the way of people making that change? What do you think is, what are people captured by? Like what has been the past model of leadership that isn't serving us very well at the moment, isn't enlightened enough for the circumstances you've described? Two really key things. One of them is history. 
history of hierarchical structures, command and control attitudes of you come in and you do what you're told and then you rise through the ranks and then when you get to that level, then you get the, you get the badge and then you of honor and then you go through that. I think that's one big thing, which all has to be rethought completely, which is how do teams work together? How do high performing teams work together? The role of leadership coaches, the role of leadership courses that help people think very differently about how do you get the best result, not necessarily how do you work your way up in a career for life. The second piece, I think, is also the attitude around leadership style. So we talk, we talk in the past and or increasingly about servant leadership, but empathetic leadership. I interviewed hundreds, if not, if not hundreds and hundreds of leaders throughout lockdown. And the number one thing that came out in the hundreds of interviews that I did was empathy. So the EQ really, really matters and coming from a from a history of largely male-dominated leadership. There's my memory has to be re-talked through. Those are probably two things to really think about. One of them is, does your hierarchy serve you and your organization? And is that inspiring your talent to stay with you when they've got choices? And the second thing is, how do you serve your organization to be successful rather than expect mm. people to turn up and serve you? And that's a big mind shift. Yeah, I think that's a critical point, isn't it? That last one around... I mean, it's, it's often been talked about and it's, and it's a term that's bandied around by the side of certain leadership, but well, I often like to think of it as leadership is essentially a social contract these days. It's mm-hmm. not rank or title, which is what it used to be. And you actually have a obligation as a leader. I'd love to hear your perspective on this, Julia. You have a perspective to look after the safety of your team right. and yeah, put yeah. them in the strongest position to do their best work. Yeah. And that actually yeah. requires a different perspective about why you are in a leadership role, a different motivation, mm-hmm. and it requires a different set of skills, exactly to your point about the EQ. Uh, but is that something that gets talked about a lot in, in, in the sort of the worlds that you move in? Yeah. Yeah. So the, probably the biggest driver at the moment is the conversation about mental health. Yep. And that's not a conversation we used to have five, six, seven, no, eight no, years that's ago. Right. You know, and it's yep. wonderful. I think it's a very, very positive move that people are talking about their mental health. Absolutely. Recognizing Absolutely. mental health. Along with that comes a discussion about psychological safety. I have a, I have a, a couple of views on that. One of them is I don't think that, I think there's a very fine line between organizations being held to 100% account for people's psychological safety, because what it does is it negates the individual to take responsibility. So I think we have to be very, very, but that, that's why the conversation about mental health has to be a sophisticated and considered one. But I think also the other thing about, we talk a lot about the, the mental health of teams, but we don't talk enough about the mental health of leaders. Yeah. In order to be one. highly performant in your emotional intelligence. And you're asking people who have come through a historical pathway, and I'm thinking particularly of men of a certain, certain age who are now thinking, actually, this could be my last job, so I'm not going to change anything. I'm literally hanging on. Some yeah. people call them the permafrost layer. Some people call them the sticky in the middle, right? That, and, and I'm just repeating what people have said to me in yeah. my interest. Yeah, yeah. It's actually to be able to say to them, well, actually, let's think very differently about how do you feel that you are performing very well? Because you're asking people to make big changes. It's very easy to go male, pale, and stay on and just you know, throw insults at, 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 at people in the conversation about diversity, equity, inclusion. But actually, this is a, this is a group of people who are having to make a considered change. And again, that's where the leadership training comes in. That's where the coaching comes in. Because actually it's about saying to them, we've got you, right? We recognize you're having to make a shift. We recognize that you need to think differently, behave differently, and that may be uncomfortable. So how do we make you feel very safe and supported in making that change? When you can do that, that's when people blossom. We know that because that's what we're asking them to do for their teams, but we don't spend enough time thinking about the leadership team. And that's, that's why this is so important. Yes, I suppose the risk is that we can overburden further leaders who are navigating all of those challenges that you, you sort of enumerated at the beginning of our conversation. And then you tell them, oh, all the things that you learned and that you imitated, learned, were trained to do as a leader. Yeah, those are all wrong. And you now need to get your heads and your emotions and your your self-belief around Mm -hmm. the fact that Mm -hmm. you've got to go on this big change journey yourself. That's hugely intimidating. And, you know baby change science will tell us people will just dig in. People will just go, if you don't support me, you don't break it down and you don't help me, 
I'm going to stay where I am because it's too risky to do anything else. Could not agree more. And there's another big piece, which is, by the way, don't screw it up because we've got performance to deliver. So actually, that's that's why this support, everything we're talking about, that's why it matters. It's not just a peripheral, this is great. Let's talk about all becoming a lot more emotionally intelligent and all that stuff. That's why this yes. matters because it's about delivering performance. And I want to ask you a couple of questions, actually. because I know, Yeah, like, go for it. So you, you've left, right? A big organization. Yep. You know, you, you've, you've worked for global companies. You've run regional organizations. And now you're setting up oh, this wonder, weird and wonderful world of entrepreneurship. I've heard you talk about, which I want to understand more about, atomic leadership. So, so let me throw the question back to you. What do you mean? I talk about enlightened leadership. What do you mean by yes. atomic leadership? Yeah, well, thank you for, for putting that question out there. I've always been struck, both from my own experience working in you know, large corporate network-owned agencies, largely globally owned, oh, working in the UK and working in New Zealand, but also talking to a lot of client leaders, people working in their own other, other sectors, other organizations, how whenever we talk about leadership, we always think it's the big stuff. We always think it's the big set pieces. So to be a leader, you have to, you know, have your vision and then you have to have your strategy, which usually comes in a PowerPoint deck. Um, and then you have to do a town hall and then you have to speak to the people and it's always struck me that this is a highly ineffective way of leading. And increasingly, the reason I talk about atomic leadership is in two senses of the word. If we break down leadership into the smaller repeatable actions that people can take, that leaders can take, grounded in real self-awareness of what it takes to connect with people, what it takes to motivate people to change, and then we repeat those over time, you get exponential results. But because it's not flashy or set PC or sound grand, it's the sort of, it's what I sort of call the plumbing, you know, it's like, it's all the little things. What somebody once described it to me is it's the sort of connective tissue in the organization. And as the leader, it's your job to foster that and to nurture it. And, and that's where I think it comes to psychological safety. You create a set of expectations and behaviors that you model yourself for how you want your teams to operate. Mm. Uh, so that when they have to tackle challenges and when they have to tackle all of the, the disruption that's happening and the transformation that's inevitably happening to our economies and our businesses and our society, you, you've got that connective tissue. Because so often people get told, oh, we need to put together a multidisciplinary team, chuck all these people together. No one bothers with the human connection piece. Dust isn't built. Pressure comes on. And then everybody resorts to fight, fight, flight, fight, or freeze mm -hmm, under pressure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's when you get all that toxic behavior that starts to happen. That's why teams start to collapse in on themselves and start to underperform. So I totally agree with you. It's... Atomic leadership for me is about saying, yeah, let's actually just forget some of that generic MBA playbook stuff about leadership. What does it actually take to lead another person? Mm -hmm. And it takes connection and trust and appreciating them as a human being to actually get the best out of them. And, and I'm sort of curious when you think about, you know, we, we touched on the, this sort of subject of like servant leadership, how you see that differing from, from atomic leadership? Yeah, well, in a way, I, I don't think it, I think what I'm hoping atomic leadership does is it, it, it almost grounds servant leadership because I think it fits really well with it. I think it absolutely shares the same ethos, which is as a leader, your fundamental first, first sort of order of leadership is to get the best out of the team that you have at any given time. And, and so, you know, as I said before, leadership is a social contract. It's mm. not a rank or a title or an entitlement or just a rung in a hierarchy. And, you know, you talked about that quite vividly earlier on, Julia. So servant leadership is the idea that actually you're there to put the team in the strongest position to do its best work. Yeah. Uh, and so you're there to sweep, you're there to shield, you're there to cheerlead, you're there to apply resourcing, you're there to manage difficulties, you're there to fill the line if you need to. Because without leaders that see 
that way of operating, you are essentially, there's all that wonderful thing, isn't there, about, you know, it's the old, the old seagulling analogy, isn't it? You know, really poor leaders come in, they swan in, they fly in, shit all over everything, and then fly away again. And that disempowering cycle that you can get into right. of the leader that goes, no, I had an answer in my head, and that's not the answer I was looking for. So the bank's team, but no, we'll do, we'll do it with the answer that I've already had in my head. Well, why have a dog and bark yourself? What's the point in having a team in the first place? And you know, one of the things that I've just, I just realize, you know, I, I think it's a return to the framing of relentless change of technology, global dynamics, sustainability, purpose, digital talent, all that stuff. You cannot have all the answers. So actually smart people figure out that you don't have the answers, but you have brilliant people around you. But you know what? This is all good on paper, isn't it? This is all great. You know, so you and I sit here, I have a cup of coffee in London, you're in, you're in Auckland. But like, so what makes it difficult? Why are people not doing it? What, what obstacles do we need to overcome to make this shift to atomic leadership? Well, I think it, I think it built on some of your earlier comments, actually, because I've been reflecting on the fact that typically we learn, we, as humans, we just learn by copying. Mm -hmm. So your only way of learning any sense of what it is to be a leader is to copy, imitate, and, and receive the wisdoms from the generation that have gone before you. But if that generation that's gone before you or several generations have been rewarded by operating in a certain way and have been promoted into leadership by a certain way, you're going to pick up an awful lot of bad habits aren't going to serve you well when your organization that you're now responsible for or your department or your team, people are captured by the past and they're captured by the habits that they feel comfortable with. And it's, it's kind of that leadership paradox thing where the things that got you the leadership role will likely be the things that blow up in your face and derail you as a leader. And it's this paradox that people often struggle to understand when they transition from specialist roles into leadership roles where it's not about their ego and their work. It's about how they get the best out of a team. Right. And I think, yeah, the barriers are that it, there's just, there's a, a, a lot of talk of leadership and you're right. We can sit here and have this conversation, but the reason why I focus on atomic leadership is I think it's, there are actually some small habitual things that you can do that aren't overwhelming to start resetting your practices as a leader. I think one of the things I'm, I'm really optimistic about at the moment is I think that there is a wave of leadership that really gets this, whether it's enlightened leadership or yes. atomic leadership. And, and this is no longer the preserve of the head of HR. So first of all, it's my sort of final question to, if, to throw it back to you is, well, what, 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 what do you want people to do? Well, I would love people to start thinking about leadership as, as, a, as a discipline in its own right something that you actually have to engage with, but also not to be overwhelmed by it. Mm. And that to see it as the adoption of two or three practices or behaviors that they can take where they shift and model their own behavior. And I think what we forget as leaders is somebody once told me when you're a leader, you're always being read. You are a text. You are, whether you're speaking or not, everyone is looking at you. Everyone is looking for clues. You know, we're, we're always wired for threat. We're like meerkats in the workplace, aren't we? Even if you're on a, even if you're on a call like this, we're all little meerkats. We're all looking, we're popping up and seeing what's going on over there. Another little meerkat impression, I have to say. Okay. What do you think? Yeah. Very good. I'm wasted in this field. But, you know, we, we operate like that and we are reading constantly the energy, the temperament, the mood, the climate that's often created in a business and in a workforce and in an organization. And, and, and there are things that, sh small shifts that we can do very intentionally and habitually that actually calm and send really reassuring signals to the teams that there's nothing to see here. And I think science, the science of behavior change reinforces the fact that small things repeatedly done create big results over time. So no, Julia, thanks for your time. I know you've got a dash, you've got a whole heap of things you've got to get through in your day. I've got to sort out some children as well. So, another part of my life as a leader, family leader. Anyway, thanks for your time and uh, yeah, look forward to connecting you again soon. Yeah, great to see you. Thanks for asking me. Cheers. Speak yeah, soon. No. Bye.